I'm Toby McPherson from Page, North Dakota. I've been a, uh, I'll say, crop duster, aerial applicator for this. I'm, I just finished my 44th year, 42 years in business at this spot, uh, Page, North Dakota. This, this is a project I've rebuilt a number of ag cats, and this is serial number one that uh, I hope will be flying this spring, early spring, and flying it around to air shows maybe, and, and flying and whatnot, just to commemorate our 100, actually 101st anniversary of the crop duster industry. Uh, and this was serial number one, the first specifically built airplane by a major uh, company, Grumman Aircraft Corporation, uh, that was built. And from there on, they built uh, just just under 2,900 airplanes all total uh, for the crop duster industry. They, in 1985, was the actual last airplane built. Good friend, John Wakefield from Cooperstown, North Dakota, about 30 miles to the northwest of us right here. Um, seen it on Facebook, or on, yeah, well, Facebook also, but uh, on uh, Barnstormer. And, uh, he calls up right away excited. He says, hey, serial number one's for sale. We gotta buy it. And I looked at my phone and thought, what's this weed crap? And anyway, he had, him and I had both, uh, well, I, I'd rebuilt a, a light frame egg cat, which is what we call the earliest ones, uh, light frame because they didn't have, uh, they weren't beefed up like they are the last ones that were built. And anyway, um, he, he told me to go down and look at it and he put some money down to hold it and he said you and Casey go down, a good friend uh, who flies one of his airplanes, one of uh, John's airplanes. When it was down in Hoxie, Kansas, which is in the northeastern uh, part of the state and uh, we picked it, well shoot, uh, it was about two years ago, February 24th, we went down and looked at it and so been Working on it, I guess, for two years. Uh, not, let's see, I farm and I spray, and, and uh, in, in between all that, uh, we work on winter projects and during the winter. And that's when I, that's when we worked on it the first year. We, well, we got it home. Uh, well, we got it home that day, 20, March, February 24th. We bought it and brought it home. And uh, the big thing on it, uh, there. Uh, was only, there's only been three original owners of the airplane. It was sold in, by Dick Reed in Hatai, Missouri, Mid-Continent in 1958, and sold it to a guy in Eastern Kansas. And then uh, he flew it for seven years, 58, now 50, yeah, 50, it's 58 model, but he flew it from 59 to 65. And then uh, he sold it to uh, Peterson in uh, eastern Nebraska until in 1965 to 1995 he sold uh, or the guy in uh, Nebraska flew it 30 years he sold it then to Roger Mauck who from Hoxie Kansas owned it until that's who we bought it from so from 1995 to 2020 it was 25 years he owned it also for, so for three for all those years to four years, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there was three owners in there, and uh, the airplane had just under 10,000 hours total time on it, and had never been wrecked. Uh, and for a, a spray plane for that old to not be wrecked, it's it's pretty rare, and especially the early earliest ones like this. But uh, we I stripped it, got it back home. In fact, one of my pilots flew it home from Hoxie, Kansas, a five-hour flight. We got it home that day, and and pretty much I had one of the had one of the corners of the shop here, and had one of the guys, one of my mechanics, or yeah, uh, one of our guys, just start disassembling the whole thing. And we tore it all the way down to uh, well, it looked just like the fuselage looked just like bare structure, and uh, we cleaned, blasted, uh, primed and painted. Uh, well, we just primed it because that's how the original ones were. Is prime. And this, you know, this this color green, uh, zinc chromate green. It's military color green, and uh, it was Grumman built. And Grumman built a bunch of military airplanes in World War II. Uh, the, the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Bearcat, the Tiger Cat, and 
uh, they how they in fact this was one of the airplanes that uh, Dick Reed how it got the name AgCat he's he's a spray dealer down in Midcontinent in Haytime Missouri and they brought the airplane out to him and asked him what should we call it well being it was grum and built in agriculture it fit pretty easily AgCat and that's to this day that's still what they're called obviously there's been a lot of modifications to a number of them over the years there's been a twin cat a fat cat a king cat a maxi cat and they all have their own the first one i rebuilt i called it the cool cat so i have that little sticker on it but anyway that's how we got into it but uh and john had built uh or well Bob Odegaard had rebuilt him a light frame egg cat, a serial number 66, I think it was. And mine was 232. So um, that's how we got interested in the light frames. And, and we're old enough to know that the, the light frames were the, they were the best flying egg cats, just like a lot of the airplanes. Um, the more they built, the heavier they got because they added stuff on them with a bigger engine or, you know, that type of thing. So, but they were the best ones. The best flyers, and uh, um, I guess that's how we grew our passion, our interest in him, and that's how it all started. Uh, he's he's seen it in Barnstormer, and and knowing a little bit about him, uh, we uh, that's how we him and I got it, and, and, and uh, I do his maintenance and on other stuff, and that's how we uh, with that's how we got it essentially got it home and we've been working on it well for two years essentially off and on um, everything's original on it so just like the i mean it's uh, that's what took so long was just getting everything back it had been modified over the years to to be just like an essentially that one there i mean all the mods have been on it as you can see it has a little windshield it has no cockpit but that's just what that's a rollover structure is, uh, is what the back behind it is so that if you roll over, it doesn't, you know, pinch you or anything like that, or you hope not anyway. So, um, then the, the, the wings are over in one of the other, the other shed, but, uh, uh, if you've seen it down at, uh, Savannah there, the nozzles and everything were in the leading edges in that. Uh, and that was how they were originally. The, the engine is a, as I said, a 220 horse Continental engine. It's a, as you can see, a radial, seven cylinder radial. Uh, the hopper or the tank in it is 180 gallons, which uh, uh, it, it apparently wasn't uh, enough of a, enough horsepower on the engine to really carry that load. Um, so they, within a hundred hours in the log books, they put a 450 horsepower engine on it, a prep engine. And I mean, those engines were built plentiful in World War II. They were used on trainers and uh, some, uh, well, mostly trainers, I guess. And, and uh, there was a bunch of those left over after the war. So uh, guys modified the firewall forward here to put those on. And, and um, the first first airplane that I had flew, or I flew, rebuilt, had the 450 horsepower engine on it also. So, but this one, uh, like I say, we wanted to put everything back to original and, and this engine, uh, everything up to up to the engine, including the mount and, the, and I had to make all the calling and stuff, but that's all serial number one. I had to look hard to find the engine mount, but uh, he swears it is serial number one and, and tracing it back, it, it looks like it is. So, um, uh, the engine isn't from the original airplane, but it's uh, the exact same engine uh, model uh, that was on the first airplane. It'll burn, uh, hoping 12 to 13 gallons of fuel an hour, and it's only got a 33 gallon tank, so uh, in two hours you need to be pretty close to an airport or to your fuel tank. So, um, the pump, uh, the spray pump is a wind driven pump. There'll be a there'll be a fan and a pump. You can see the hole or the hose coming out of the hopper right there. That'll go down to the pump, and then in turn the pump will go back out to the leading edges uh, where the booms are. But it's a wind driven pump, and there's a brake on that. 
on the pump to uh, when you're empty, you use the brake on it and, and it stops. This is where the pump goes. It's a wind driven pump. It's got a brake on it, uh, meaning when when uh, you run out of chemical, you put the brake on it. Otherwise, it, it over speed with uh, no resistance in there. Uh, here's I modify had to modify the exhaust here because um, it it. Uh, it was just, well, it was about this long is all. And uh, here's the air inlet. And of course, uh, just like us and, and other engines, uh, they like fresh air. Well, it was sucking the exhaust right into that air inlet and uh, the engine quit. So I found out about that pretty quickly. And, and a lot of guys put it, modified it to come down here, right? Um, we put extension, right? done that to a number of other airplanes and, and I thought, well shoot, well, that sure seems simpler. And so that's what, I, that's, what that's about there. But, but, uh, this is an air intake scoop uh, for, with a filter in it. And, and uh, uh, it's pretty important to have fresh air. So, but this was all, I had to rebuild all the, the cowling and the side panels are all new. Some paint we had to do on a little bit, but I gotta find these fasteners because you know, that's really the only thing that I'm you hoping know, to find enough for, for all the sides on it. Like I say, everything will be back to original if I, if I can find those. This is chrome molly steel tubing, which is like all the race cars, all the airplanes uh, are made out of chrome molly. It's, it's the hardest steel you can find. And uh, the tubing, uh, there's different width, widths and uh, on it. Just as you go, you know, go to the back. Um, it's not quite as thick as up here where most of the weight is at. So you can come in here and look at the cockpit. That's how simple it was here. And um, you had your engine instruments, airspeed. And altimeter essentially is all you have. Oh, tachometer, I guess, is right here. Well, here's your, here's the rudder pedals and brake pedals. The big master cylinder right here. Of course, the brakes, disc brakes over on the wheel there. Uh, it was even their their uh, Warbird had that same type of pedal on. So you know, Drummond built and that stuff. So for. Uh, they use some of their wartime stuff. The, the reason uh, they went to the biplane, the, the industry started in just after World War I and most of, the bi most of those airplanes were biplanes. Uh, you know, that's when barnstorming really started. Uh, World War I, they had Curtis Jennies, they had uh, standards, uh, about half a dozen different airplanes uh, that familiar names that, that uh, I mean, the Wright brothers even built airplanes. Uh, but anyway, that are used today, Douglas built, uh, they were all fabric and wooden built biplanes. And the industry started, in, uh, how the crop dusting first started was in 1921. Uh, there was uh, Catalpa trees in Ohio that they used for telegraph poles and of course, that essentially was the internet or across the country at that time. Well, as me, uh, telephones hadn't come in yet, but the uh, telegraph was, anyway, they needed the poles or the trees uh, because they were a hardy tree. And, and uh, well, a, a catalpa tree is fast growing, it's it's hardy and uh, it did the job. Well, uh, they had a, there's a sphinx moth that would lay eggs and a caterpillar would come out and, and caterpillar in turn would eat the leaves off the catalpa trees and, and this is 1921 somewhere in 1921 and they'd go up there in the trees and try and dust the uh, arsenic of all things on the tree and and they get a little bit I mean work good but they get nothing done and you can imagine I mean the poles for the telegraph going across the country how many they needed so they they uh, took 
55 gallon barrel and, and most of the biplanes were, were two plays so a, a gunner would sit in the front you know what you've seen the gun on the top wing or in the where they time actually timed it to miss the prop if they went through the you know right between the, the wings there anyway the uh they, they put a barrel up in that front hopper which is just exactly where that would be and cut holes in it and then just made a chute and they pulled the chute when they went over the field and the dust would fall off. Well, they seen it would just fall in a narrow path so they made a, a spreader so it would spread out. Uh, the, the vacuum would, would force it into the veins of that spreader and then spread out very neatly. Well, that's hence they seen it work great uh, with arsenic on those caterpillars and, and that's how crop dusting actually started. Okay, so Biplanes were really the only airplanes that were built the, that, the early days. Uh, they continued up to World War II and, and then the, uh, the Stearman, the biplane, uh, was the main trainer at that time. And they built like 12,000 of those airplanes, of course, in four or five years. And, and uh, the war lasted just that, four years pretty much. And, and after the war, there was a lot of Stearmans around. So they went from the wooden and fabric airplanes to the Stearmans, which still had fabric on them, but, but they were more metal. And, and so it was a, a better airplane. Well, they, they took the, the front cockpit on those. Like I say, those are training airplanes also, but they took that front cockpit and put the tank just like where this one is. Essentially, that's 180 gallon and, and that's how it was that's probably how big some of the Stearmans were uh, when they started, I believe, and then they went up 250 gallons. But that's just where it was at. And then they had a spreader out the bottom and they were starting to spray liquid at that time. Uh, after World War II, they started spraying liquid and, and uh, uh, the biplane was just more maneuverable. And that's why they continued to make or try and use, use the biplane, the ones that they, they had. And the Stearmans, they, uh, up until, uh, neighbor uh one of the he was actually an instructor during world war ii in the stearman lived 30 miles up, uh, just straight east of us here and he bought 25 of them after the war for 500 bucks a piece and uh he flew them modified them all those years from 1947 to 2004 when he passed away uh, but he he's in the national aviation hall of fame agriculture aviation hall of fame those airplanes weren't built with the rollover structure though either. It was just an open cockpit and uh, no no turtle rollover deck, which this is all tubing just like this right up here. And that's, that's covered. Uh, they just had a little windshield and then it was flat behind here. So when the airplane would roll over, you, you still had injuries or fatalities and, and not to, I mean, you still once in a while in this one, but your chances of survival are, were a lot better. This was the first actual spray plane that uh, was made uh, with a rollover structure. His he was right out in front, right? And no, no, uh, no uh, rollover structure or anything. It was just he was right out in front by the engine in front of the hopper, and he was the close first one to the crash. If he crashed, so so they built these. Uh, if you were going to crash an airplane, you wanted to be in an A cab because of the rollover structure and that upper wing is pulling it forward or would pull where how it's rigged and, and made it would pull it forward at that wing so it wouldn't come back into your lap or anything or you know your body so that was uh the, the ag cat was the airplane from from 58 on to 1980 was really the airplane of choice you know for 20 mid 80s still well I was, I started in 1980 and I rebuilt uh, probably about 15 egg cats over the next 20 years. It's been fun. Um, I guess the ultimate, I guess, uh, ultimate goal would be to, uh, yeah, have it in a museum one day, which, um, a lot of places like Sierra Number Ones, you know, especially when it's built back up to original. 
So that would be my alternate route.